Welcome to the Antioch Podcast, designed to nurture knowledge, cultivate creativity, heal the heart, and strengthen for service. Thanks for listening, and welcome home. So I was reading, so we're we're almost done with Esther now. We took a week off last week, and and Esther is a very interesting book. I think Brad mentioned it, right? In this entire book, God is not mentioned ever. You can look through it. Nowhere does it say anything about God. Anything. And so I'm reading this, and it's so, it was hard for me at first because I'm like, it feels like I'm just reading a story. Oh, cool, that's cool, that's cute. Not cute. God saved his people. That's nice. What a nice sentiment. God saves us. And I can read it for what it is at a very surface level. Or I can see that God is showing us something in this even though he's not mentioned directly, because I guarantee you, like we were saying earlier, God is always working, whether or not we acknowledge him or or we see it or not, he is always there. And even in this book, even though you might not see the word God anywhere, you might be like, well, I don't read that book because it doesn't say God. God is in it. Jesus is in it. I'm convinced. I mean, when, when it says that everything on earth was created through him, everything is by him, through him, and for him, that this story somehow This story, and I don't need to force it or coerce it, or like I said, sugarcoat it anyway, that Jesus is in this story in some way. We start out by by Mordecai, right? This great guy, Jew guy, Jew guy. He said the and and remember like the first thing he does, right? He he foils this plot by these these guards at the gate, right? He hears the guards, right? They're gonna they're gonna assassinate the king, he reports it. And then does anything happen with Mordecai after he reports it? It's very interesting. You go to the next chapter, and it's it's very different. It says, then at that time, Haman was exalted among all the, like, wait, wait, what happened? Mordecai just foiled this whole entire plot. Shouldn't he get some credit? Shouldn't he get some glory? You're not going to be judged by what you did, but why you did it. Are you serving God because you are serving unto the Lord? Are you serving him to get credit from man? And it's so cool because I see Mordecai and like, it just happens. And I'm like, I'm reading this. I'm like, it seems kind of messed up. But then I realized my heart posture. I'm like, wow, why is it messed up? Because, oh, I want Mordecai to get recognized. You should get something cool to happen to him. It's like, why am I seeking the world's glory instead of God's? Because then later, as we see, it comes back. Remember, uh, we read it, uh, it was two weeks ago. So um, King Xerxes, he can't sleep, right? So he has the, the chronicles come and, and read to him. And they read to him, they remind him of the story of Mordecai when he foiled that plot. And then Xerxes remembers, hey, wait a minute. Did I not, did we not do anything for this guy? Did we forget about him? God didn't forget. Dang, right? Like if he to receive glory, like just think about God's hand. If you receive glory at that moment in time, and meaning all whatever, right? Xerxes probably would have forgotten about it and just moved on with his life. He stopped. He couldn't sleep. He read, he had the chronicles read to him. And then they're like, hey, this guy, uh, you know, he foiled this plot to kill you. And Xerxes like, wait a minute, we didn't, we didn't honor this guy? And then right at that time, Haman's walking in, right? To ask to have Mordecai impaled on a pole, right? You don't see God's timing in that? Like how perfect. So like, we're so quick to be like, well, why don't I receive my blessing right now, Lord? I did all these good things for you. Shouldn't I be rewarded right now? I did something kind and nice. Like, God doesn't forget. God doesn't mock those who believe in him and who trust in him. But I am more, there's a bigger story at work in our lives than the the tangible that I can see right in front of me. And we're so quick to give up eternal things for a tangible moment right now eternal pleasure for temporary satisfaction. I mean, we say it, but it's so true. We do it every day. But God doesn't forget. And, and in that moment, so God, he sees him. And then well, we, we ended with, I mean, it's kind of a dark thing to end with, right? But he had uh, uh, Mordecai impaled on that 50-foot pole. Oh, not Mordecai. Oh, no, 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 sorry. <laughs> Haman. And, no, don't, don't do the thing. Don't do the thing. We say Boo. I'm going to say it too much. That's why I won't be able to get through. I got, I got 20, 12 minutes. Um, he has uh, Amon impaled on this pole that was meant for Mordecai. And then the king's fury subsided, right? Okay. 
So I'm going through eight through 10. So this is kind of the end of the story where, where the Jews get their vindication and then Purim is established. And I'm just going to read it to you. And then I, I'm just, man, like Jesus is in this. And I'm like, whoa. So I want you to see it. So I pray God opens your ears and your eyes to see what Jesus is showing you through what's going on in chapter eight. So I'm going to read chapter eight. That same day, King Xerxes gave Queen Esther the estate of Haman, the enemy of the Jews. And Mordecai came into the presence of the king, for Esther had told how he was related to her. The king took off his singet ring, which he had reclaimed from Haman, and presented it to Mordecai. And Esther appointed him over Haman's estate. Esther again pleaded with the king, falling at his feet and weeping. She begged him to put an end to the evil plan of Haman the Agagite which he had devised against the Jews. Then the king extended the gold scepter to Esther, and she rose and stood before him. If it pleases the king, she said, and if he regards me with favor and thinks it right the thing to do, and if he is pleased with me, let an order be written overhauling the dispatches that Haman, son of Hamadatha, the Agagite, devised and wrote to destroy the Jews in all the king's provinces. For how can I bear to see disaster fall on my people? How can I bear to see the destruction of my family? King Xerxes replied to Queen Esther and to Mordecai the Jew, because Haman attacked the Jews, I have given the estate to Esther and they have impaled him on the pole he set up. Now write another decree in the king's name in behalf of the Jews as seems best to you and seal it with the king's singet ring. For no document written in the king's name and sealed with his ring can be revoked. I'm going to pause right there for a second. There's something so important to see even, even with Jesus and, and God in, the, in this part. There was an order given out to kill God's people, to destroy them, put them to death. That order cannot be revoked. For the penalty of sin is death. That order cannot be revoked. That doesn't stand, right? I mean, that, that, that doesn't, you can't go away. That judgment is always there. Can we just remove that, God? Can we just like, get, get rid of that, that judgment on us so the penalty of sin is dead? No, no, I can't. But go ahead. I'm going to put another decree out there that gives you the option and the authority that it doesn't have power over you anymore. Like, what? How do you not see Jesus in this? Okay, so you go further. At once the royal secretaries were summoned. On the 23rd day of the third month, the month of Sivan, they wrote out all Mordecai's orders to the Jews and to the satraps, governors, and nobles in the 127 provinces stretching from India to Kush. These orders were written in the script of each province and in the language of each people and also the Jews in their own script and language. Mordecai wrote in the name of King Xerxes, sealed the dispatches with the king's signet ring and sent them by mounted couriers who rode fast horses, especially bred for the king. The king's edict granted the Jews in every city the right to assemble and protect themselves, to destroy, kill, and annihilate the armed men of any nationality or province who might attack them and their women and children, and to plunder the property of their enemies. We have been given power over death. Not by ourselves, right? We didn't do it. That decree came out. From all, right? There was no power in our ability to take back that edict. It was set, in, like, you can't take it away. But there was another edict that was sent out. Jesus came. He said, I give you the power over death. Do not fear the world. I have overcome the world. He fights on our behalf. Mordecai wrote that decree on, our beh on the Jews' behalf, right? Oh my goodness. How do you not see? I mean, I just like, you can read it for what it is, right? But then you see Jesus in the story of the gospel in it. And I'm not trying to force it, right? It's like, it's like right there, right? I'm not, I don't feel like I'm trying to force it. Whew. The day appointed for the Jews to do this in all the provinces of King's Xerxes was the 13th day of the 12th month, the month of Adar. A copy of the text of the edict was to be issued as law in every province and made known to the people of every nationality, make disciples of all nations so that the Jews would be ready on that day to avenge themselves on their enemies. The couriers riding on the royal horses went out spurred on by the king's command and the edict was issued in the citadel of Susa. 
When Mordecai left the king's presence, he was wearing royal garments and blue and white, a large crown of gold and purple robe of fine linen. Like I picture like this is a picture of Jesus, the Messiah, right? Not that Mordecai is in any way, but it's a picture, a foretaste of the Jews' redemption and the world's redemption through Jesus. Like look at the, like he's leaving with royal garments, a crown upon his head. And the city of Susa held a joyous celebration for the Jews. It was a time of happiness and joy, gladness and honor. In every province and every city to which the edict, the edict of the king came, there was joy and gladness among the Jews with feasting and celebration. And many people of other nationalities became Jews because the fear of the Jews had seized them. Like, right, you see this? Like, I feel like I'm not real. Like, am I really reading? Like, is this there? Like, yes. Wow. And I love it because you know that day didn't come yet. They celebrated before they got the victory already, right? It's like the whole, the kingdom's now and not yet. Right, we live in a world, why is there still suffering in this world? Well, why are the Jews celebrating? They could get overpowered in a month and a half or whatever, right? I mean, sure, the edict's there, but like they're celebrating as if they've already won because they have already won. They know who they serve, right? Right? And you see that it doesn't mention God, but you see by their response, by how they act, they know who their God is. And the fact that that edict came out and allows them to now defend themselves, they know, oh, we're not scared anymore. You know why? You know who they're fighting against? I mean, you say they're in captivity, but the, the, the Agagite? Now, Agagite should sound very familiar because there's a king way back in the day that was commanded to kill a certain group of people, but failed to do so. And his name was Saul. And he was supposed to wipe out the Amalekites for their sin. They had attacked, the, right? There's, all sort of, there's a lot of Jewish story behind this, and, and we, won't get, we don't have time to get into that. But I just want to, I want to tell you, there is something to be said about God finishing what he started. Because King Saul was commanded to wipe out the Amalekites, not take anything, not plunder anything, do not keep any cattle or anything for yourself and to kill everybody. I know that seems harsh, but guys, we don't read scripture correctly sometimes. Okay, we think, wow, well, God's so mean. The God of the Old Testament is different than the God of the New. No, no, no. There is judgment in the New Testament as well. That same judgment is there. The only difference is like in Esther, we have an edict that now allows us to have that power over that judgment. That judgment has never gone away. Jesus did not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it, right? So this is very, not a word of the law will pass away, right? It, it, we very important to understand this, okay? But, he, but Saul didn't do it. Ooh, that's not good. His pride got in the way, captured the king. Oh man, we were talking, Brad was talking last week, how pride, right? Very dangerous thing, pride. And now I want you to read the next part because then when they attack, it's very important. They're, they're fighting against the Agagites. These are, in theory, we, we don't know for certain, but you can, the way the story is written makes it seem as though these are the remaining Amalekites that were not wiped out. And it's so interesting because then we read through, okay, chapter nine now. On the 13th day of the 12th month, the month of Adar, the edict commanded by the king was to be carried out. On this day, the enemies of the Jews had hope to overpower them. But now the tables were turned and the Jews got the upper hand over those who hated them. The Jews assembled in their cities and in all the provinces of King Xerxes to attack those determined to destroy them. No one could stand against them because the people of all the nationalities were afraid of them. And all the nobles of the provinces, satraps, the governors, the king's administrators helped the Jews because fear of Mordecai had seized them. Mordecai was prominent in the palace. His reputation spread throughout the provinces and became more and more powerful. The Jews struck down all their enemies with the sword, killing and destroying them. And they did what they pleased to those who hated them. In the citadel of Susa, the Jews killed and destroyed 500 men. They also killed, I'm going to, these five people, all these people, okay. So the 10 sons of Haman, son of Hamadatha, the enemy of the Jews, but they did not, they did not lay their hands on the plunder. They, in the edict, they were allowed to take the plunder. The edict they allowed them. They did not touch it. Like, why? They knew something was going on, right? They were, they were more aware and more, it was more important to them to follow God's law than the law of man. 
let that sink in. They had the, the right and the legality to plunder this when they, when they killed them. They did not because they knew they weren't supposed to. Why did they know that? Because they, this is a long-standing story of God's judgment and God's vindication. Oh, man. They lay hands on the plunder. The number of those killed in the citadel of Susa was reported to the king that same day. The king said to Queen Esther, the Jews have killed and destroyed 500 men and the 10 sons of Haman in the citadel of Susa. What have they done in the rest of the king's provinces? Now, what is your petition? It will be given you. What is your request? It will also be granted. If it pleases the king, Esther answered, give the Jews in Susa permission to carry out this day's edict tomorrow also and let Haman's 10 sons be impaled on poles. Oh, there's so much. I, uh, I can't, I don't have time. One minute. So the king commanded that this be done. An edict was issued in Susa and they impaled the 10 sons of Haman. The Jews in Susa came together on the 14th day of the month of Adar and they put to death in Susa 300 men, but they did not lay their hands on the plunder. Again, it says it. They knew something, right? There was a bigger story at hand here. Meanwhile, the remainder of the Jews who were in the king's provinces also assembled to protect themselves and get relief from their enemies. They killed 75,000 of them, but did not lay their hands on the plunder. Why is it so important that it keeps saying this? They did not lay their hands on the plunder because again, it's a fulfillment of like God's promise. And they were more concerned with following the law of God and the command of God than the command of men. Even in the midst of captivity. Wow. This happened on the 13th day of the month of Adar and on the 14th they rested and made it a day of feasting and joy. The Jews in Susa, however, had assembled on the 13th and 14th and then on the 15th they rested and made it a day of feasting and joy. That is why rural Jews, those living in villages, observed the 14th of the month of Adar as a day of joy and feasting, a day of giving presents to each other. I just, I, just like you just see God in all of this. Oh, man. Mordecai recorded these events and he sent letters to all the Jews throughout the provinces of King Xerxes near and far to have them celebrate annually the 14th and 15th days of the month of Adar as the time when the Jews got relief from their enemies and as the month when their sorrow was turned into joy and their mourning into a day of celebration. Like, like you just like, see it for what it's saying too, right? Don't, don't read it. This is so important. I encourage you guys, just side note really quick. And I promise I'm, I'm going to read through this fast. We don't think deeply enough about Scripture or just about things in general. Maybe we're scared to think deeply because we've been, we have this false fear that somehow we're going to be found out or that it's going to be wrong if we think too hard about it. So we want to play ignorant or naive to this. But it's like, if you really believe this is true, the farther you dig into this, the more it makes sense and the more true that it gets. I, can't, I, can't, I don't know how to explain it. Like, the more I study scripture and the more I look into the background, all the historicity and like, the, you know, I'm not trying to make it a, like a legal or religious thing, but like the more I think deeply about it, the more it makes perfect sense. We're just too scared to do it. Or maybe we don't want to do it. Maybe we're content living comfortable with our lives. <sighs> Mordecai recorded these events. Uh, we read that. Um, so the Jews agreed, to, so sorry, in verse 23, nine, chapter 9, verse 23. So the Jews agreed to continue the celebration they had begun, doing what Mordecai had written to them. For Haman, son of Hamadatha, the Agagite, the enemy of all the Jews, had plotted against the Jews to destroy them and had cast the pur, that is, the lot, for their ruin and destruction. This is so important because you go back to the beginning. Remember when Mordecai wouldn't bow down to Haman? He would have probably just had him killed, right? But it says, and then he found out who he was. He was a Jew. And you have to remember, he's like, hey, he wiped out all my people back in the day. That's my story. I'm going to wipe out all. Because it seems like an illogical jump, right? Mordecai doesn't bow down. I'm going to kill all your people. But when did that happen? He found out after he found out who he was, right? It's so important, right? There's a bigger story here, right? Like, I, I just want us to see it for what it is. Okay, sorry. So then we, we sometimes don't, we think it's like such an illogical jump and that's why the story doesn't make sense because it must be fiction because no one would just make a jump like that to kill all the people. Like, no, no, no. If you see the history behind it, it makes actually perfect sense. Anyway. But when the plot came to the king's attention, he issued written orders that the evil scheme Haman had devised against the Jews should come back onto his own head and that he and his son should be impaled on poles. 
Therefore, these days were called Purim for the word Pur, because of everything written in this letter and because of what they had seen and what had happened to them, the Jews took it on themselves to establish the custom that they and their descendants and all who joined them should without fail observe these two days every year in the way prescribed and at the time appointed. These days should be remembered and observed in every generation by every family and in every province and in every city. And in these days of Purim should never fail to be celebrated by the Jews, nor should the memory of these days die out among their descendants." This is so important because when God comes through and does something, it's so important to remember these things. We don't, we don't remember. We, we give the Israelites all sorts of flack for forgetting, right? You should have just crossed the Red Sea. You know, you're complaining about onions. How much has God redeemed you from that you still say, where or where are you, my God? It's true. I'm the same way. I'm not, again, I'm not speaking out of uh, condemnation or anything, but conviction. Nothing wrong with conviction. So Queen Esther, daughter of uh, Abihail, along with Mordecai the Jew, wrote with full authority to confirm the second letters concerning Purim. And Mordecai sent letters to all the Jews in the 127 provinces of Xerxes' kingdom, words of goodwill and assurance. I will come again, right? I mean, I'm just just reminded when Jesus said, don't, don't, hey, I did it, we defeated him, but it's good that I'm going to the Father because I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit, the helper. All right, don't forget, right? And here, like the Holy Spirit's job is not to give us the ability to heal sick people, right? That's not the, the Holy Spirit's job is to keep us focused on Jesus. That's the Holy Spirit's job is to keep our eyes fixed on him. Why was this eked out? So that they would always remember what their God had done. May I never forget. That's the Holy, the Holy Spirit's work in my life is to constantly keep my eyes fixed on Jesus. When that happened, oh yeah, sure. All sorts of other consequences of that come out, right? Good consequences, right? But my, the primary job of the Holy Spirit is to unify us in the body and unify us with the Father. That's it. Okay. Uh, where did I stop? Perm, did the word because Jew, Esther's decree confirmed these regulations about Perm. Okay, da, 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 da. Okay, chapter 10. King Xerxes imposed tribute throughout the empire so it's distant to its distant shores and all his acts of power and might together with a full account of the greatness of Mordecai whom the king had promoted. Are they not written in the book of the annals of the king of Media and Persia? Mordecai the Jew was second in rank to King Xerxes, preeminent among the Jews. Like you see a picture of, of Jesus, right? Sitting at the right hand, right? Mordecai what, the Jew uh, was second in rank to King Xerxes, preeminent among the Jews. And he held in high esteem by his many fellow Jews because he worked for the good of his people and spoke up for the welfare of all the Jews. And then the last thing I want to point out, it's like, right, so the Jew, right? They, were, they overcame, not by themselves, but by the work of someone else. Allowed them, gave them power over that. They still had to fight. But the fight was, the battle had already been won. You see them celebrate before it even happened. Right? They weren't concerned because it was a battle that they weren't concerned. It was a battle that God was fighting for them. And that's why they didn't take the plunder because they, already, they saw what was happening. This is a, a, a final done, like God's work is done in this matter, Right? And then Mordecai is exalted, second in command, right? But what's so interesting is the the Jews, they're still in captivity at this point, right? I'd love to say, and then they got sent back to Israel. They established the temple. Everything was good. No, no, no. They're still in captivity. Jesus' work is done, but we're still here, right? I mean, this this was the flaw of the disciples. They wanted Jesus to annihilate the Romans, That was their idea or their conception of the Messiah. The job of the Messiah was to come and reestablish Jewish rule. But God had a bigger picture in mind. Like you're not seeing it for what it is. In the same way, right? This edict, now it's all done. It's finished, right? They they defeated their enemies. Everything's good. Captivity's not over. They're still there. But now they have hope. They have joy. They have peace. Peace. They have this edict that's out there that allows them the power over their enemies, not by their own work, but by the edict that came out from, quote unquote, on high, right? From the, from the palace, right? From the, that, those with authority. And it's like, if you don't read this and see Jesus and the gospel in it, I'm sorry, like, come on. And you notice, right? There's nowhere to say anything about God in this whole story, but Jesus is in it. God is working in every one of your lives right now, even if you don't see it. My prayer every morning, God, open my eyes to see and my ears to hear what you are already doing. I don't need to force your hand, Father. Your hand is already moving. 
And I believe that I've been created for such a time as this, in this moment, in this day, at this hour. Use me, Father, for your glory. That should be our prayer every day. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who have sinned against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. As simple as that. But there is something so powerful about Jesus' prayer life in the same way about ours, right? I want to take my faith. I want, it, I want it to mean something. I don't want to sugarcoat it. I don't want it to be stories you read. I don't want it to be something we just do on Sunday and then go back to our regular lives as if nothing has changed. Let the Holy Spirit do his work in your life. But you have to turn and face him. You have to repent. That's all, I mean, that's it. But he is so faithful. And he is, oh, man, I have to stop because it's 1140. But we finished the book of Esther. Look at that. I told you I only needed, I, you know, I got, I'm sorry, I took 10 more minutes. The Lord took 10 more minutes. Yeah, I can blame him on that. You know. But I, I want to encourage you guys. Like, If we really are the body of Christ, let's be the body of Christ. Like, Come together weekly, not out of obligation, not because we have to, but because we want to. Like, I can't wait for Sunday. If you're getting in the car and you're like, oh, I don't want to come to church. Oh, I'm so tired. I had a long weekend. It's like doing what? What's more important? Do you, I mean, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. You guys, the main question comes down to do you really want it? I am convinced if, if you truly want something, you're going to do it. You will. You want to get closer to God? You say it, but do you really want to get closer to God? Because if you truly want it, you would make steps to do it. Like, get up early and pray. I can't get up early. Yeah, you can. Stop. I have four kids. I'm up all hours of the night. I'm tired as heck all the time. But it's true. We make, we make, don't say that you can't. Say that you won't. At least be honest with yourself. At least be honest. That's my thing. I mean, like I said, I'm not trying to condemn. I'm trying to convict you, right? Be honest with yourself. Because the, the, the worst thing you can do is deceive yourself to destruction. I don't want to send you to hell sitting in a church pew. And you say things like, oh, well, that's fire and brimstone. Fire and brimstone is real, you guys. We, we say it because we don't like it. We're not, it makes us uncomfortable. I'm sorry, guys. The gospel it is uncomfortable. You're called to die. I'm all about preaching the love of Jesus Christ and his kindness and his mercies. Are, that is there. But the original edict was death for sin. Don't forget that. It, I mean, the, it's... Jesus, thank you for dying for me. Like, really, dying for you. Like, do you understand? I, I can't grasp it. It wrecks me all the time. It leaves me undone all the time. And it should leave you undone all the time. Like, oh, I don't want to play church. It's not a game. I don't, I don't want to play this. I want to, ch I want to change the world. Not for my own glory. And pride's very dangerous, right? But for the sake of Jesus, for his kingdom, for his dominion. I want to, 12 people change. How many Christians live in Riverside, yet Riverside is still in darkness? 12 people, well, 120 if you count all the people in the upper room, change the entire world because they actually believed it. They were willing to die for it. Like, I know that it's a, it's a gut check and I don't want to say this to anyone, but like, are you really willing to die for the gospel? Like it needs to be something you think about. I'm sorry if it's too uncomfortable for you, but are you actually willing to die for Jesus? Not just die spiritually. I'm not I'm just going to die, kill my flesh. We say these Christianese words, like I mean like physical suffering and death for the sake of Jesus Christ. We want to, uh, Leonard Ravenhill, man, he gets me sometimes. 
We'll cry and plead over the last drop of the blood of the martyrs, but we won't give the first drop of our blood. Oh, thank you, Lord, for those martyrs overseas that are dying for the gospel, but God forbid I give a drop of my own. Like, come on, church. We're too comfortable in America. I am done being comfortable. And I'm not preaching, like I said, I'm not preaching fire, I'm not bringing condemnation to the world, but at the same time, like, they need hope. We have it. They need joy. We have it. Give them that. Don't just condemn them like, well, you're going to hell for your sins. What sins? I'm fine. I feel good. I like the way I live. But what you can tell them is, well, do you have joy? Mm, that's going to be hard. Do you have hope? They might think they do. And then you really get into it. You're like, oh no, they have lots of issues. Oh, they, I have something for you for that. Not that you're giving Jesus a try, but I have something for you that will change your life. I don't know. I'm, I'm excited because again, I feel God is doing something. I'm done because I'll keep preaching again for another hour, so I gotta stop. But let's, let's go, church. Like, come on. Let's leave the building and change the world. And don't be afraid of what you'll say in those moments. I'm reminded when Jesus said, when, when they bring you before the, the trials and before the governors as a, as a witness to the Gentiles, don't be worried about what you will say. For in that hour, the Holy Spirit, you will not be you that's speaking, but the Holy Spirit through you. Amen. Don't be worried. Don't feel like you have to have, a, the Holy Spirit will give you the answers. If you're walking with him, seek him with your whole heart, you will find him. Do you actually want it? Let's not just sit here and give lip service all day. Maybe I'm just getting older and I'm over it. <laughs> uh, it's like you get to a point in your life, you're like, well, why am I doing this? What's the point? Unless you really believe it, because you really do. Wow, this is, this is a privilege and this is amazing. Thank you, Father, that we get to take part in it. Ah, oh, and give that hope to a dying world. Oh, man. Woo, gets me fired up. Thank you for listening. To continue the journey, you can find us online at IamAntioch.com or join us next Sunday.